see that the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends to his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and he carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in the balance? Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct the Lord as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? And who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They're regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Lebanon is not sufficient for altar fires, nor its animals enough for burnt offerings. Before him all the nations are as nothing. They're regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youth grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Isaiah chapter 40, all right? Now, Isaiah chapter 40 is an amazing chapter. If you do not already have something marking that in some way in your Bible, you want to do that because this chapter is great just to go back to over and over while we're kind of in this situation, this, you know, chaos of life that it is. This chapter brings us to remind us about the sovereignty of God. That no matter what's going on in this world, it starts with the big. It starts with the macro, the, the things that are going on that are just big. They cover the whole world. They're everywhere. It's the universe. He says he comes in with power and with strength and with might. So you see the hugeness of God in verse 10. And then verse 11, he brings it down to the micro. He says he's a shepherd who takes care of his sheep. And then it says, even a baby lamb he picks up and holds close to his heart. Think about that image. I've never had a baby lamb, but in our quarantine COVID life, our family got like a tiny dog, like a little three pound dog. All right. 
Chewie is the cutest little dog. But if you pick up a tiny little cute dog like Chewie, you know how you hold that dog? That's in here, right? You don't do that. Like, how many of you have held a baby, hopefully, right? When you hold a baby, do you do this? Some, right? And the, they take it from you immediately. When they see that this is how you hold a baby, it's not. What do you do? You bring that close to your heart. You're protecting. You're creating this, this little cushion area, this safety. And then no matter what you do, what happens to you? You start doing baby talk. I don't care how old or masculine or tough you are. You're like, you know, you instantly change because you're holding close to your heart. And you see the vulnerability, the tenderness, the smallness. So that, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 10 says, God is huge. He, the whole universe is his. And then verse 11 is this. And he will take that little lamb, that's you, and he's concerned, holds you close, knows what's going on in your life. So throughout that chapter, you see the hugeness. It goes from big to small. It talks about how God, the creator of the universe, the oceans are in the palm of his hand and spill over. It talks about how uh, he measures the mountains like with a kitchen scale, like you would be cooking with. And, and the dust that falls out of your measuring cup, that's like islands to him. And that this is what the universe is to him. This is the God that we serve and we worship. Something that is so transcendent in power beyond all of the things that go in our life. In verse 27... He talks about uh, the princes, the rulers. No sooner are they rooted, no sooner do they plant that he blows them away. I think everyone is so anxious about an election coming up. You can't, you can't Google cute puppy videos without getting an advertisement from one of the people, right? It's everywhere, everywhere you go. In fact, if you walk out of your house, the first, it doesn't matter who you talk to, right? It always starts like this. I'm not sure which side of the political spectrum you're on. And then they start their speech, right? You know, I, I was out of the house the other day. First person I run into, they were a Democrat. So I got all of the, hey, if you don't vote for me, the country's going to end. So, so do this. Then the very next person I run into is a Republican. So you know what they do? They give me the whole speech. Hey, if, you know, this is the biggest election. If you don't vote for me, the country is going to be destroyed. Both of them think no matter what happens, this is the end of our country. And it's just anxious and it's just fearful. But what does Isaiah 40 say right here? Nations rise and fall a drop in the bucket to God. And that a prince takes power and whew, to God it's nothing. Begins to put in perspective these things that we are so anxious about these huge things in life these things that are happening that we feel like are just out of control and beyond us we realize that to God his power exceeds him so much and on those giant things I think it might be easier for us to to concede yeah only God can control a hurricane or a pandemic or you know national powers but what happens when it comes down to your life then we feel like we have a little more control, right? Oh, this is, this is my job. This is my financial situation. I control that. This is my marriage. I control that. This is my character, my, my, my willpower. I control that. These are my kids. I'm in control of that. These are my health. I should be in control of that. And those things that get closer to us, we feel like we're more in control until something happens, right? And then we realize we didn't have control of our own lives all along, did we? And that is really a harder time to trust in God's sovereignty. Because we can admit the sovereignty of God on things that are too big for us to handle. But when it comes into the details of our life, it is so much harder for us to accept the sovereignty of God. We usually begin with the idea of it's not fair. We begin with, that, with the blaming. Something is happening and it's not fair. It's my spouse. If they were this, if they were this. It's not fair. It's the, it's the government if they did this or that. It's not fair. It's the situation. And, and we begin in this thing of blaming and, and taking what the sovereignty of God and giving it to someone else and saying that person 
is controlling my life with their actions, with their things, with what they do, they control. We take God's sovereignty and we give it to someone else. And if we live in that world of it's not fair and it's in the blaming and the handing it over to them, we're going to be a mess. And so some move past that point and they'll get to a statement like, it is what it is. How many times have you heard it is what it is in the last six months? Right? That's kind of a a pointless saying, but it's just accepting reality. It's like, I can't control any of this. It is what it is. You know, that's, that's just what happened. And that's nice to accept reality, but that's a far cry from coming to truth. Because the idea of it is what it is, that could be anything. That's like, yeah, Murphy's Law, whatever could go wrong will go wrong. That's just the way it goes. Or, or maybe it's karma. If I do something good, something good's going to come back to me. If I put it out in the universe, it's going to come back to me in some good way. It is what it is. And that mindset of just hoping that you've moved from I don't blame someone else to now I just accept reality that still doesn't bring you to truth or to help you find what God is doing here. There's another step forward. And that's where we want to end today. We want to end with that third step of where our mindset has to be in all this thing that we're doing. And we see in Isaiah 40, it begins with the macro, the big things of life, and comes all the way down to the things in our life that really are the biggest to us the things that impact us immediately, our families, our livelihoods, our relationships. And seeing that God is sovereign in all of these things. And so Isaiah 40 lays that foundation. And Isaiah 40 was uh, a chapter that was quoted at the end of Romans chapter 11. We've been studying the book of Romans all summer in a series called The Deep End. And so today, that's where we're going to finish that series of Romans. So Romans chapter 11, if you guys have a Bible, whether it's on your phone or whether it's at home or wherever, look at Romans chapter 11, because we're going to go through several verses here that help us see, one, how God's in control of the large things, and then brings it down into our life. But what I hope that you leave with today are two statements from these verses that you can hold on to as a promise and as a prayer for your life today. Okay, so in Romans chapter 11, what we have happening is the book of Romans gives this great explanation of salvation, of what it means to come into a relationship with God. And it begins in chapters 1 through 3 of laying the foundation of original sin and how that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And those three chapters say that that's universal to all mankind. There's not a person or a nation that that wasn't condemned into sin. And then chapter, the end of chapter three and the beginning of chapter four, it turns and it shows that the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so foundation is laid. And then that gift comes. And that gift brings being adopted into Christ. Being, uh, being a part of it. Being justified by faith. By the works of Christ. Not by our own works. And then they go to. They prove it by using the nation of Israel. And the journey that we have recorded in God's word. The Old Testament. All the way through. How Israel was God's chosen people to represent him on earth. And to see that process. How that they weren't better. How that they weren't righteous and they weren't pure. But God used them anyway in his design. Now what happened as you look at that thing. As you go through the Old Testament. You see God's working in their lives. But then it goes silent. They don't hear from God for over 400 years. And then when Christ comes as the Messiah that was promised all along, they don't even recognize it. They don't even see it. 
It looks like God's promise never came. They're expecting a king to conquer the world and to to end all things. Instead, you have a man come in an insignificant town, only known by a few that an angel told, and then growing in these small towns throughout Israel, which at the time was an insignificant player in the world. And you just see how God's plan of a messiah was so different than they expected that they were blind to it and missed it and then even in fact killed him last sunday david talked about the pruning of israel how by its disobedience and blindness god had cut it off and then grafted in something new And that's where you are today as we look and we see where the Christian faith is and where those who see God, we see the church exploded all over the world in a whole different direction than anyone thought previous to Christ. And you'll see the word over and over, the word Gentiles, which basically just meant people not in Israel. And you see how God's plan of salvation was mysterious. It was a little bit crooked, a little bit unexplained. And in our minds, we like for it to be a straight line up, don't we? We would like to look at God's plan and say, it starts here, it's bad, something great happens, and now everything is good. We would like that to be the case in this story. We would like it to be the case in our own story. Isn't that right? Don't we always want it to be that someone came, they went to church, they said a prayer, and then after that... Sin was gone in their lives forever, and now look at the difference it is. We want that to be the story. But what's reality? If any of you have followed Christ for a very long time, you know it's different. Especially, how many of you came to Christ when you were a child? Like, I was five years old, grew up in in the church. It would be hard for me to tell you how terrible a four-year-old I was, and then I met Christ, and now... Look how much better. No, I did all my evil sinning after I became a Christian. All right? It wasn't a pathway of that we want. And that confuses us. Because we think, well, I thought it was supposed to go like this. And it doesn't. And so as we look at the end of Romans. And the people that he was writing to thought it was supposed to go a certain way and it didn't. And he has to bring them to the place to see, look, God is in control. Let's read that. Verse 25 says, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. So here he's talking about the the macro, the big, Israel and Gentiles. And it says, in this way, all Israel will be saved. As As it's written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them. When I take away their sins, as far as the gospel is concerned, they're enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. So as you look at this first section, you could get bogged into trying to understand each other area. But it's a summary of what was built up in earlier chapters of understanding that process of, of Israel not seeing the Messiah. It being closed off and then so many people outside of Israel coming to see Christ as the Savior and how they're grafted in. So he's describing that big picture, the macro of life, how it seemed different than what they had expected. But what I want to draw your attention to and what I'd hope for you to write down or underline or remember is verse 29. God's gift and his call are irrevocable. I want you to look at that promise, God's gift and his call are irrevocable. Think about that. Think about that. We see that God proves that in how he handles the nation of Israel, bringing it through the scripture. But he uses this, one, to say, look back at that. 
But this becomes the hinge of this verse that after this verse, it's now going to talk to you personally. It's not going to talk in the big picture anymore of how God brought Israel and Gentiles together and all of this. But he's going to look at you individually and say God's gift and his call are irrevocable. It says in verse 30, just as you were at one time disobedient to God and have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he might have mercy on them all. God is bringing the big picture of that journey into your life. And you could probably look back in your life and see the times that you have gone away from God. And you see God's faithfulness to you. If you're here today, you probably came back, right? And with, with honesty, we look through the times of our lives, we've seen that we have so many times ventured away and back, away and back. But God's gift and his call are irrevocable. You're resting on God's sovereignty, not your ability. Many of you have been praying for your children for years. And you need this promise that God's gift and his call are irrevocable. Maybe you've been praying for a spouse or a loved one. And it just doesn't seem like the change came the way you thought it would change or the way the life pattern was supposed, it didn't go right. And you need to realize that God's gift and his call are irrevocable. Some of you would look at maybe what happened to you during this quarantine time. You might be ashamed of things that you did, things that came back into your life that you thought were gone. And you just have to go back to this line and say, look, God's gift and his call are irrevocable to you too. Not just nations, not just the big things that only God can control, but your life, God's gift and his call is irrevocable. You might be experiencing so much anxiety about what's going to happen. When are schools coming back? When is this coming back? When is this going to happen? When can we be normal? When can we hug and not wear a mask? And, and we, we're just wanting life back. All you can do is say God's gift and his call are irrevocable. We have to lean on that now. And so he leaves that line there. And then he goes in to finish this chapter with something that uh, is called a doxology or just simply a short song praising God. Verse 33 says, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? That verse was quoted right from Isaiah 40. That's why we started with Isaiah 40. Who has known the mind of the Lord? When God speaks of his sovereignty, he's often reminding us of our place. You may have remembered uh, maybe about a month ago, the story of the artist and the clay, where God says, look, I created everything and you. Are you now gonna teach me how to run your life and your world? It puts us in this place like a baby, like a little puppy, like something fragile and adorable that has to be held close. We realize when our life begins to fall apart or be difficult, we now need the sovereignty of God. We realize we weren't in control. 
And so here he says, who knows the mind of God? Who has been his counselor? Verse 35, verse 35 of Romans 11 is a quote from the book of Job. It says, who has ever given to God that God should repay them? If you know some, you know, Bible history, the book of Job is a long book of the Bible in the Old Testament. But it's the story of one man, Job, who God took everything from. Children passed away. Money was lost. Sickness. His wife turned against him angry. Everything was lost. To a level that I'm sure anyone with any pain could relate and say, okay, this guy knows. And as he's crying, God, why? God, why? What, what did I do? Did I do something? We always think, did I make control of this somehow by a bad act? But... And God just points him to his sovereignty and says, do you have control over this world? What does God owe you? Did did you give God something that he owes you something right now? And he changes his mindset from why it's not fair to I'm in control. Trust me. And it ends with verse 36, this very interesting line. This is the second line that I hope you memorize today and that you can carry for a while throughout this process. The first is God's gift and his call are irrevocable. Stand on that promise. Then it says, this is the mindset we need. For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Think of that statement, from him, through him, and for him are all things. This line is the mindset that God is trying to bring us through in our relationship with him. No more blaming other people for our life. No more just it is what it is and just floating through life and not seeing that God is at move and what's going on. But realizing, it says that all things are from God. That's so confusing when it's bad, right? When it's bad, things are like this. I don't know how God has anything to do with this. And we have to lean on his sovereignty. You won't figure it out. That's the whole idea of God's sovereignty, of having to lean on him knowing all things and me not knowing things, is that I won't be able to figure it out and tell someone when they're in pain, hey, don't, no, 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 God's going to do this and then this and then this and this. That's, that's what it's going to be, so cheer up. It doesn't work that way, does it? I have to begin to put myself in the place as the one who was created by a loving father and let him say he's got to be in control because it's all from him. And that's where the through him comes. It says, and through him. The only way that then I can work through these things and live through these things is now through him. I have to rest on God working in my life, giving me the strength, giving me the peace, helping me understand, helping me to follow and seek after him. Because now I have to live through him because all things come through God. And then finally it says, and are for him. It is for the glory of God. Our salvation, my salvation, your salvation, was not for me, it was for God's glory. He is the one who brought it through. He is the one who offered himself as a sacrifice. He is the one who's granted faith and life in him, and he is the one who brought resurrection to our lives. It's for God's glory. It all came from him and it's through him and it's for him. I think the great example of Christ as we, anytime we look at something that's hard for us as people to try to emulate or live, we must look to Christ as the example. And so here you have Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. This is the night before uh, the trials began, before he goes to the crucifixion. I'm not going to read from one passage because you kind of have to read three of them to put the full story together. It's from Matthew 26, Luke 22, and John 18. They each describe it there and you can put them together to see different aspects. But on that night, Jesus is in the garden in 
and just anguish prayer. It says that his prayer is so painful and heartfelt that he's sweating drops of blood. That he is looking at what is coming in front of him. Seeing not only the physical pain of what it means to go to the cross, the betrayal, the loneliness, the humiliation, the torture, the idea of, of being hung on a cross and your own mother is there and having to, to have her see this, to, to all those physical things that were done to him, but then the spiritual anguish of knowing that this is the moment of holding all of our sins upon himself, of having God turn in judgment to him, of having the condemnation of hell placed on him. So as he's seeing these things come, something beyond what you and I, what our pain could comprehend, it says he's in prayer and in anguish. And what is the answer that he arrives at before he gets out of prayer? It says, not my will, but thine be done. He has to move to the place. I don't know. I don't know. That's probably wrong. He doesn't have to move to the place he's got. He has the statement there where he says, it's all from him, through him, and for him. And so in that heart, in that mindset, you see every action after that, repeating that. So then he's in the garden and they come with him with a mob and Judas, the betrayer, to kiss him. And his disciples say, Should we, do we attack? Do we fight? And he says, no. If I wanted to get out of this, I could call down angels from heaven and eliminate this. But this path is from God. It's through God. It's for God. So he submits to being arrested. Throughout the trials, mock trials in, in bogus courts before rulers and before people, all just full of lies and, and, and things. And you know what? He doesn't make a case of self-defense to end it. He receives the mocking. He receives the judgment. Because he knows his path is from God and through God and for God. All the way to the point of the cross. Where in the final moments he stretches out and says, it is finished. It's done. He has taken our sins upon him. He has fulfilled all the prophecies spoken of him. To live the life. To, to, to be the sacrifice to be the righteousness for us that we could never be because I was for, from God, through God, and for God. And so that example we follow has to become our mindset through this life. No matter how difficult, and I don't want it to feel as if that that's not a concern for the pain that is there but an understanding that God's power and sovereignty is so huge to govern all things, but his tenderness and his mercy to also know the things that are in your life to hold you close. Today we're going to have communion together. And communion is such a beautiful picture of understanding that, that our salvation is from God. He is the one who set all things there for us. Our creator, when we had departed from him, when we had left him from our own sin and our own rebellion, he made a way for us to be re reunited to him. The story of Christ, the purpose of the Bible is to show us God's way that he has done to redeem us. And so it is a gift from God and then as we take part in this communion, we are reminded that that wasn't just a thing you realized like when you were uh, at high school or when you came to Christ or when you were young or something your parents taught you. It wasn't just then. But every day we need to be reminded of this, right? 
We have to live through God. Each day there's new trials and struggles and things that happen in our lives. And we have to remind ourselves of the gospel of Christ. His love and his forgiveness for us. Our reliance upon him. Our need to trust his sovereignty. Our need to to pursue him. And so communion is a reminder that even today we need the gospel. And then it's for him. This communion is a reminder that it says as often as you do this, you show his death until he returns. We live this life anticipating Christ's return. There is an end to this that ends in a reunion with God. It is a celebration. It is a, 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 a rejoining with God. And today is a reminder of the past of what he did, of the present of what he's doing, and of the future of what he will do. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Isaiah chapter 40. Teach it to us. like Burn it in our hearts that we might know it. Lord, remind us in our difficulties that your gifts and your calling is irrevocable. Things that we've done, you offer forgiveness. That we can repent to a, a loving father who would receive us. Lord, as we look at the difficulties of things in our world, help us not to be a victim or, or not to be just wandering through life. But help us to see that all things are from you and through you and for your glory. And give us that peace and confidence to live for you then. Amen.